Well, Doug, I want to thank you so much for being on today. And I'm excited about talking to you just about what you're doing um, across the world for Jesus. I honor you and your wife. I honor the work that you're doing. Uh, you fill a lot of hats. I know that many of people have called you apostles and uh, an apostle, a prophet. Uh, you've you've done it. You've done it. Are you walk in all capacities? But you, you're a real humble man, and I I love the fact that every time around, I'm around you, I or I talk to you, I feel Jesus. And so that's the most important thing is that we love Jesus so much that it comes through. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, so that the ladies can know you a little bit about how you ended up in Houston? Your journey, a little bit. Of your journey that would be great a great place to start sure i'll, I'll make a, a short version of it uh in 1978 a long time ago i was 21 and uh, felt like there's a piece of my life still missing and my uh -huh. father my biological father left when i was about 10 he had retired from the navy he had actually served at the tail end of world war ii the korean war he was stationed in japan for a period of time after the korean war and that's where he met my mother and um, as a result, of course, I was born and and uh, and then during the Vietnam War, he was known as a Navy SEAL. He was part of the UDT Frogman, part of the crossover, became known as Navy SEALs. And um, so as a result of that, uh, when they went through a divorce during the Vietnam War, um, I just felt like a piece of me was missing. I wanted to find my dad. I came to sure. Houston. He had retired. And it was great to see him, but that was the journey really where my heavenly father was actually looking for me. And wow. so it seems like all the pieces came together. I was running a, a chain of fitness centers and I ended up opening my own place. My best friend was killed over a drug deal. I was living in sin, professing to be a Christian. And I felt this deep conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, don't call me Lord anymore unless you're willing to live for me. Wow. And it was in that place on my knees on South Gessner in 59 in Houston, Texas, that I say, God, if you can do anything with someone like me who has broken your heart and brought shame to your name, I want to serve you the rest of my life. I'll make myself available. And literally, it's something in that moment of accountability, because I'd said that many times, but something about that moment that he turned my world upside down. And I haven't looked back. And one day I woke up and I had an apartment in Sugar Land where Stafford, somebody gave me and I uh, had six people living there. Somebody gave me a house and uh, near Katie. I put 12 more there. I didn't know about deed restrictions. And, <laughs> and another we had 17, I think, living at one time. And that's how I kind of got started. And, I, and to this day, I still don't know exactly how we got where we are. But uh, that same prayer, God, if you can do anything with someone like me, I'll make myself available to you. And every day during one of my two prayer times, I pray, Lord, I just want to, again, make myself available today. I want to walk in simple obedience, which is the highest form of worship with you. And uh, whatever you do with me, I want to be available and I want to be directed by your Holy Spirit. Well, that you have done for all of us to see. And I've just known you from afar. Can you tell us a little bit about somebodycares.org and what you're doing with that? That's such an incredible um, organization that's making so much difference in so many lives. Sure. During the 1980s, I noticed that we went to a lot of uh, places, high crime areas in Houston area and other places. A lot of young people, and I was young, of course, too, but a lot of them would throw tracks down and they wouldn't read them. So I started, Lord, I need, I need a strategy. And so I actually would put out a business card uh, that said, somebody cares 24 hours a day. And I would have a hotline phone number on there that people could call and wow. we would take turns 24 hours a day to, you know, answer calls, return calls, pray for people. And I found that simple card where they would throw down tracks, not that those tracks were bad because we had tracks that worked too, but those cards, people would keep them because something about the term, somebody cares. So we kind of evolved in this idea that area churches and ministries want you to know that somebody cares Houston and became somebody cares Tampa Bay, somebody cares New England, somebody cares wow. Baltimore, somebody cares all over the world. And we have affiliates and chapters and uh, partner ministries from Haiti to Colombia to Botswana, Africa. They're all over the world that are related to us in some capacity on every continent. And so we realized simple prayer of obedience uh, to, obey, to be obedient and walk in availability has turned into this theme that became known as Somebody Cares America, Somebody Cares International, with partnerships, churches, relationships, and chapters everywhere that every day, 365 days a year, are, are being available to serve God in some capacity. If it's 
poverty eradication, if it's reaching the homeless, if it's helping those that are that need you know personal ministry, if it's working in high crime areas, we have all these great relationships that are doing something around the world, and so we become known internationally as a, a prayer prayer organization, but also because we've done it national international prayer initiatives. We're also known for our Compassion Coalition of Ministries, Compassion Evangelism. We're also known because of these relationships. So whenever there's a crisis or a disaster, a hurricane, tornado, tsunami, we already have relationships there. So we work to and through wow. those local churches, ministries, and organizations long before, even in some places where the United Nations or anybody else show up, we're already working with people that are already there. Because the first responders aren't the people coming from the outside. It's the churches and ministries already on ground. Exactly and right. So empower them. And then ultimately, because of that, we've had a lot of business leaders and, and political leaders from around the world, including Muslim presidents to others who know that we're Christian, that have allowed me to pray for them, minister to them. We have a thing called Leadership Awakening, where it came from a, a theme, then a book of mine that I wrote called Leadership Awakening that is now being used uh, across the nation and other parts of the world. You know, you were doing uh, revival and, and reformation before we had language for it, for it, <laughs> because really you've been you've been uh, serving and promoting prayer initiatives as long as I can remember. And then right alongside of it, doing the hard work, the standing, the providing of resources and needs, because really that is part of Reformation is the church, not just praying in the closet, but actually being the hands and feet of Jesus. And now I believe the church um, glo globally, but for sure in America, I believe it's starting to wake up to the importance of, yes, we must pray, we must fast, we must do the cornerstone of revival. We must have revival. We must, we must see a spiritual awakening, but we also have to walk out the reformation piece. We also have to walk out the practical piece of just being there and, and allowing God to use us to help meet people's needs, because that's how we get their attention first and foremost. Uh, you, had to, you and I were talking a couple of days ago and you were talking, we were talking about just what's going on in America, what's going on with women across America, the revival that's taking place, and and the army of the Lord um, that's just being that's arising in women. Um, I know when when 2020 hit, well, actually when 2016 hit, and I'm watching TV and I'm watching that um, that Me Too movement, that movement of women. Uh, and I'm not here to throw stones at anybody, but it is what it is. I'm watching women arise and saying, "This is what we believe," and it was it was counter it, it was counterintuitive to anything that I stand for because I live my life according to the Bible and according to God's word. But I'm listening and watching, and I'm realizing, you know what? God's got a remnant of women. God's got, in fact, one of my friends who has an organization called Deborah's Voice, she said, literally, the spirit of God rose up inside of her. And she said, you're, you're not speaking. She's literally yelling at the TV saying, you're not speaking for me. And God said, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? In fact, she's getting ready to run for uh, Congress, and I believe she'll she'll win, you know. But she, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to make a difference? And so she began to call for women to pray, to fast, and to actually be a reformation piece, to use their voice in the ballot box, to use their voice on the school board, to use their voice in all areas of influence, not with tearing people down, not with fighting and fussing, but standing for what is true and use our voice while we have a voice. And then 2020 hit, and we all know what happened with 2020. I mean, it was like nobody was seeing, nobody saw that coming. I didn't see that coming. I'm sure there was some prophets somewhere that prophesied this is coming, but I didn't hear it nor see it. And then all of a sudden we're all at home. Um, churches are being shut down. Lots of things are happening and we feel like we're in a swirl, you know? And I remember pastor Todd and my sister's husband uh, saying, you know what, we're going to, we're going to shut the church down for a few weeks and kind of get our bearings and pray and fast, but we're going to pray online morning, noon, and night. And we're going to do it for our congregation and our community. And I took the 8 a.m. shift 
Doug, because that's my normal time to pray every morning. And I asked Pastor Tom, I said, can I just do it on my regular Facebook? Before I knew it, there was 700, 800 women praying live with me every day because people were scared. They were, they, everything was upside down. They needed to, they needed the Lord. They needed the glory of the Lord. They needed prayer. And we started praying. And one morning the Lord said, I'm going to raise up 10,000 prophetic evangelists. I'll never forget it. And I'm like, Lord, what does that mean? He says, keep calling for women to pray. There's, I'm going to use women in a special way in this season. And I, it was like, I was taken back to 2016 when I'm watching the TV. And then I'm realizing, okay, now is the time. And then the scripture, this became like our hallmark scripture, Psalm 68 and 11. God Almighty declares the word of the gospel with power and the warring women of Zion deliver its message, the warring women of Zion. And I realized that that God was going to do something really special. It wasn't that he was, he's using men. He's using anybody that will surrender to him, but there was something special in this season with women. And he wanted us to call women to the forefront uh, to especially Christian women that are sold out to Jesus and let's stand and use our voice and let's show them the path. Let's, let's declare the word of the Lord and let's war for what is right. Not with not with guns and knives, but with our prayers, with our fasting and declaring God's word. And you and I were talking a little bit about it. And I want you to kind of just share with me what you sh shared with, share with the ladies and the ones that are watching what you share with me uh, a, a day, two days ago about, um, you know, t talking to Papa Lou and where you think we actually are in this season of time. Absolutely. And, and there's so many things that I think that God has already been speaking. Sometimes we don't recognize it until we look back and where God's brought us from into the context of where we are, and it gives us direction where we're going. And I think, just like you said, in 2016, 2020, in many ways, we didn't expect it to be what it became. No. But if we look back in retrospect, God's been speaking prophetically to us and through us for a long time. It's just we don't have context to it until we go through something. But every circumstance or adversity is an opportunity for God to show himself greater. I think out of these shakings that we're going to see something even greater come from them. And uh, through, through the crucibles of experience, one example I, I shared with you was back in uh, 2001. I was already asked as a, as a leader in our city uh, to come and open up in prayer and take a few moments to share with what they expected you know, 50 to 70,000 women called the Global Celebration of Women. It was scheduled uh, for September of 2001, uh, towards the end of the month. And uh, so they're expecting these women to come from all over the world. And these are Christians. It was Women's Aglow. It was the Evangelical Council of Women. It was all these different groups coming together as one to really uh, bring light to the atrocities to women in some places, but the importance of women coming and rising into the place of God's calling, just like you said out of Psalm 68, 11. And I really see that also as a Psalm 110, verse two and three, that says that for the day of God's power or visitation, the yeah. God will raise up an army of volunteers. And I really felt like, just like in Hezekiah 37, where Hezekiah prayed because he said that the, that it is a day of trouble, distress, and contempt because the children are ready to come into their destiny, to come forth, but there's no strength to bring them forth. Wow. Now, because the process that, how can we have a birthing of revival or the birthing of a generation if men are insecure in who they are in the Lord? Because men, true, me, biblical men, godly men, who are secure in their identity in the Lord are not intimidated or challenged by the gifts and strengths of women, but they are, they celebrate them. They yeah. empower women. So it takes men and women who can work together it, it, through a biblical, op, you know, biblical filter that we realize that we're nothing without the Lord. We need yes. each other. Yes. And so the men are strength givers. Women are life givers. And so I yeah. thought it was important for men to come alongside and give strength to women to come into their destiny so that we can birth a generation of, of revivalists and, and the, you know, the Joel two uh, Acts chapter two generation, prophetic generation coming into its destiny, preparing the way for the coming of the Lord. So I said, absolutely. I, in 2011, I, I mean, 2001, I'd be happy to, to be, to be a part. I was honored. 
And of course, 9-11 happened. And so because of 9-11, many flights were canceled. There was people up, up in arms, didn't know what to do. So probably maybe 30 to 40,000 were able to make it to the then the Astrodome in Houston. And wow. uh, Adam Lotz was there, uh, Dodi Osteen, many others, uh, people from Women's Aglow and all these organizations. I was very humbled to be a person who helped kind of open up in prayer as a man giving strength to deliver. And I, I just felt the Lord gave me a word and says, look, I know you came together to address the issues for women around the world and to celebrate the Lord, celebrate women. And we cherish that. But we've entered into a, 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 a difficult pregnancy. Right now, God's promises are still yes and amen. They're still here. And what God wants to do is far bigger and greater than what we see in the world. So I believe this is still a prophetic mandate. It's just that it's a, it's a difficult pregnancy. Yeah. And, and so I, I don't really share what I'm about to share with you, Kelly, but um, you know, I, my salary wasn't that much back then, but I felt like the Lord said to give half of my salary every month for nine months as a, as a way to, to give strength into, I knew that the budget probably was not going to be met. And so in a small way, in a small token, I, I felt like I was to give nine months, half of my salary, which wasn't a lot, but you know, is it, it was a token. It was a prophetic act. Sure. And, uh, and so, but I feel like that was something God was doing to encourage all of us that God was still going to fulfill his promises and celebration of women, but also coming into their destiny and to yeah. help give strength to that. Well, you fast forward to 2012 and Laura Allred, who was a spiritual daughter of mine. And in fact, when her father passed away, I'd committed to be there for she and her sister and for her mom. So I actually uh, opened up a position in our ministry to hire her mom, who was a widow, to work with me as a way of supporting her. And at the other, at the other, whenever any man wanted to court Laura, they had to come through me and I acted just like a dad. I was checking them out. And uh, she ended up marrying uh, uh, Gabriel Allred, who was the worship leader at Christ for the Nations at the time. And, uh, and so, of course, you know who they are. Well, in 2012, she had a sense from the Lord to take 39 young women wow. who, uh, representing her generation of young women, to walk from the large abortion clinic in Houston that had been created and to walk for 21 days, 250 miles from that abortion clinic to Dallas, Texas. And it culminated on Good Friday of 2012, in which wow. Luang called an Esther call. And then many of us Mordecais came and stood in the back. And my little, my daughter was 10 at the time. And it's all she wanted for her 10th birthday was to be a part of that march with the girls and also to be at the Esther call. That's what she wanted for her 10th birthday. Wow. So she was there. She helped pray. And and uh, we were standing, I, as a Mordecai, I was standing there. But I realized how prophetic that was. But then as I was talking to Lou Wingle the other day, um, and he was talking about the million voices and the million Esthers and Mordecais gathering on Yom Kippur on October the 12th of 2024, I said, Lou, that will be 12 years, just after 12 years since the, the Esther call and the walk from Houston to Dallas and the Esther call and the Esthers and Mordecais coming together. That will be 12 years. And it reminded me of the scripture in the book of Mark, chapter 5, of a woman with the issue of blood. She had the issue of blood for 12 years. Wow. And uh, so she pushed through the crowd oh. and touched the hems of the heart, the garments of the Lord. Now, the word for the hems of his garment was actually the dangling tassels, the tzitzis, which is the dangling tassels, not even the garment, but the dangling tzitzis, the, the, uh, the dangling uh, tassels. And she touched that. In the midst of the crowd, Jesus, who touched me? And Jesus and the disciples said, well, Jesus, everybody's here to touch you. They're, they're here to hear you. They're here because of you. What do you mean who touched you? They're all here. But he knew the difference between those in the crowd, those who just worship, those who are talking about Jesus, preaching about Jesus, right. studying about Jesus. But he knew the difference of those who are pressing out of desperation to the very hems of his garment. And that's what withdrew, what drew virtue from him and his power was released. I say, could this be the 12 years on 2024 with the million Esther's and voices of Esther's and Mordecai's gathering together this 12 year process and that there will be a, a gathering of a million voices pressing in together, not out of just because it's the religious thing to do, but because out of desperation, yeah. because God doesn't answer prayer. He answers desperate prayer, yeah. passionate yeah. prayer. 
And I think we're in a moment where we need that kind of corporate anointing out of a desperate time in our world where the Esthers rise up and the Mordecais come support and men give strength to deliver that we will see in Acts 2, Joel 2 outpouring. Men give strength to deliver. That's so powerful. Um, you're you're right on. This is absolutely a prophetic. It's all tied together prophetically. What did what did Papa Lou do when you brought that to his attention? I bet he was well, freaked out. Yeah, I was rewatching the the Zoom video, and then also we just used it for our, our, my podcast this week. And you could tell he's like, you know, I, you have to catch yourself <laughs> not to start rocking like him, right? And uh, and he was like taken back by that. In fact, he he called Laura and said, Laura, that's I think the best Zoom call I've I've ever been on. You know, I'm thinking, well, yeah, he's been on a lot of Zoom calls, but but I think just the it, it came at a moment where I wasn't even thinking about it. But as he was sharing the vision and sharing what y'all are going to be doing and a part of and and engaging. It just hit me about the women with the 12 years of issue of blood in that 12 year span, but also the strength to deliver that needed to come forth, even after the global celebration of women. Because look, think about this. What we see the Me Too You movement, but look what God was doing even back in 2001 in preparation for women, biblical mm -hmm. women, godly women addressing the issues and to celebrate women. Even back then, and look at the, the the difficult pregnancy all along the way, but God is about to press in as we press in and release his virtue and power. And I think it's so important what God is saying. It's so important to hear what God is saying and to know what God is saying and to know how to move and respond to the voice of the Lord. Um, I've been hearing over and over and over for the last probably close to two years, but the the first Chronicles 12, 32, and the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And God is asking us, he's saying, look, I want you to understand the times and the seasons, but more importantly, I want you to know how to respond and how, what you're supposed to do in these times and in these seasons. Um, one of the Leland's brother, Jack, who's his, he's actually a pastor in Franklin. He was talking about last year at crown. He was talking about Winston Churchill and I've not been able to get this out of my mind. He said, you know, Winston Churchill, if you go to re read about him in history, he was kind of a screw up. I mean, he, he, he tried a lot of things in politics. He was a politician, but he, he was either you liked him or you didn't like him. He was kind of, he was brash, but when, when the United Kingdom started facing Hitler and they knew Hitler was inevitable and they were going to lose their independence. Things were going to be different. If somebody didn't stop this wild man, they knew only Winston Churchill could get them out of it. Whether you liked him or didn't like him, he was the prime minister they needed for war. And I believe really simply that God is gathering a group, a remnant of men and women uh, across the world, really, and in America, especially, that are made for war. They understand times and seasons, and they understand how to respond. So whether you like them or don't like them, they are called for such a time as this. And he is gathering that remnant that will not back down, that will not uh, tuck and run, run and you know tuck and hide that will stand for what is right and true that will preach the word of god that will believe the word of god that will live the word of god that will fight for a nation to be turned back to god that will fight for god to be in our schools and to be in every sphere of influence and i, I see this awakening happening in america i've seen it since 2020 i can see the waters of revival arising I can see reformation taking place. I see people coming out of the woodworks, people that nobody knew that are standing up and saying, I'm going to stand for what is right and true. And God has called me for such a time as this. Are you seeing that as well? How do you feel about that? And what are you seeing and experiencing? Absolutely. You know, I, I really sense uh, for the last few years that the king is summoning his bride. Yes. And, uh, and I really believe that just like with Vashti, you know, we talk about Esther, but just like with Vashti, um, Vashti was summoned by the king and she turned him down. Whereas uh, greatness, uh, you know, people, times, places, uh, moments are are, def are are defining. 
and there comes moments where greatness or we step into greatness we don't we're not born with that but here is, here is uh, Esther who was then summoned and then she then addressed the king found favor with the king as, as she stepped into a moment and that moment created history Every year, the Jewish tradition is, you know, to, to have a time of Purim, to remember that great moment where she saved a whole people, her whole people group that was about to be annihilated. We live in such a time, prophetically, just like it is now, where there's a spirit of, of Haman that's trying to destroy Israel, but also, ultimately, anything is godly, Judeo-Christian belief. Yes, yes. That same spiritual attack of the spirit, Prince of Air of Persia, behind it all, trying to bring this, that spirit of Haman. But yet it's a Esther Mordecai time. We step into moments. We step into greatness. Yes, yeah. I totally agree with you. And you you had mentioned uh, uh, quite a few things about what God is about to do. I believe God's been speaking, but we're stepping into a moment where maybe, um, uh, you know, he was not prepared for as, as a, you know, he maybe had a lot of areas of, of, of weakness and human frailty, but he was created for that moment of war. I think we're in a moment of spiritual battle and warfare that we need to step into that moment for God to define it as a turning point. You know, there are moments in history when a, when a door for massive change is opening. This is that moment. And I think I believe, step it. That. I believe it. it's going to take those who are saying, I'm willing to become part of something greater than myself and, uh, and to see an entire generation impacted and biblical scripture being fulfilled, even as we are talking right now in preparation. It's not about what happens just on Yom Kippur 2024 in Washington, D.C. It's right. about the process, the journey that God's allowing us to step into together even now. You're absolutely right. That is, uh, I, I believe that's going to be significant. I believe that's going to be, there's going to be a turn in the nation just because of the act of obedience, but there's so much more connected. And it's like, it's like when you look back, uh, when we had the Jesus movement in the sixties and all of the people that were saved and delivered and set free and the revival that swept across America, which was unbelievably amazing. It was amazing. I was saved during that time at the tail end of that time. And, um, but but also some of the worst bills and some of the worst laws were passed at the very same time. So while the church was experiencing revival, somehow we missed we should be affecting culture. We should, you know, we were tucking our, I came out of classic Pentecostalism, Pastor Cindy and I, uh, Leland's mom and, and myself and, and Pastor Todd, we were in the United Pentecostal Church, real strict Pentecostal segment, you know, everything was a sin but eating and we figured out a way to make that a sin. And, and you know, we just, it was revival and church and music and preaching and the world was like something we, you know, we were told to separate separate ourselves from the world and, and not understanding that there was, there was, yes, we were to separate ourselves from the world when it came to sin, but we were supposed to go into the world and affect change. So a lot of, I think now the church is understanding I'm not just to get saved and have revival and tuck myself in a church the rest of my life. I'm to go out and be the church. I'm to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I am to step into the political arena, the entertainment arena, the, the education arena, uh, the financial arena, the church, the religious arena, the family arena, and to affect change. And I think we have a better understanding and God is saying to us, look, I need you to pray. I need you to fast. I need you to believe and understand the Bible and preach the word and stand for what is right and true and live a holy life and spend time in prayer every day and intercession. But I need you to go in the world and I need you to feed the poor and I need you to get involved in politics and I need you to be a righteous voice and I need you to get involved in entertainment and it's not going to be easy because everybody's going to be going left and I'm going to re require you to go right but God is calling us for such a time as this and he's calling us to have a blood-bought backbone and to you know the the my father he had four girls so there was no boys and I was he had two girls by his first wife. And then many years later, he married my mother and he had me and my sister. And he used to say to me, Callie, you were born for the fight, girl. You mm. were born for the fight. And uh, that kind of stuck with me my whole life. But it, he he was right. If somebody was, my sister uh, was the sweetest thing her whole life. I mean, she's literally 
She's about as perfect as they come. And she has lived for God her whole life. And she was pretty as a picture, you know, growing up. She had long, long, dark hair and all the boys loved her, but she was holy and chaste. But you let, but for whatever reason, all the boys wanted her to be their girlfriend, you know, so the girlfriends would get mad or whatever. And when I tell you my sister was holy, she didn't even notice that they were liking her. I mean, like she was that kind of a girl, but sometimes they would want to pick on her because she was, you know, so well liked by everybody really. And, you know, you just didn't go within 10 feet of her or I was going to tear you up. (laughs) I wasn't going to put up with anybody hurting my sister. And so my daddy used to say, you were born for the fight. And I think what's happening is God is calling a remnant of men and women that were born for the fight. They were born. Uh, You can say what you want to about Winston Churchill. He was born for the fight. He had what it took. I believe the remnant that God is collecting understands that this is a time and a season that I'm not talking about fighting with our fist. I'm not talking about being mean or angry, or uh, I'm not talking about that kind of demonstration, but I'm talking about fighting in prayer. I'm talking about fighting for what is right for my children and grandchildren. Uh, One day I was praying, Doug, and I I was praying for revival in America and I kept Mm -hmm just interceding before the Lord. And I said, Lord, I just, I want to see the revival that I know you've promised us. And the Lord said, Callie, America will have revival. There's no, you don't even have to pray for that. Here's what you need to pray for Callie, whether you'll have revival with a free Republic or whether you'll have revival underground, but America is going to have revival. He said, what you need to pray for is that the people will arise and awaken so that the free Republic can stay intact and finish. America needs to finish her course and Mm. the enemy would love to shorten our time and abort our, our mission and shorten the course of this nation. At some point, Doug, we know it's all going to end. At some point, Jesus is going to come back and we know, we know what we know. We, we've had enough uh, revelation teaching to know at some point it's done, but I do not believe with every core and fiber of my being that America is done yet. I believe the devil's trying to force us to abort this nation through really bad choices. And he's, he's, the Lord is wooing the church to awaken in prayer, to awaken in fasting, to awaken with a resolve and to do the practical things we can do while we still have a Republic. And some would say, well, pastor Kelly, that sounds like really negative thoughts and really, um, you know, that just sounds like gloom and doom. Well, call it what you may. But the America I live in today and the one I lived in 20 years ago is not the same America. It's not the same America. The freedoms that I had 20 years ago, the, 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 the um, beauty of what we believed as a nation is not the same thing that's going on now. And so what's the answer? The answer is the church. The answer has always been the church. What was the problem that got us into this place? The church. It's time for the church to awaken. It's time for the church to repent. It's time for the church to put on sackcloth and ashes and pray and fast and seek God and use our voice. I look, I've got 13 grandbabies, 13. Cindy's got eight. Cindy's got eight. And I'm thinking, I want them to be able to live in a free Republic and live for God and, and see the gospel propagated all over the world to preach the gospel, to, to go all over the world, to do the works that God's called them to do. But we've got to stand for this nation to stay intact. And we've got to take our sphere of influence, whether it's two or if it's 2,200 or if it's 2 million, and begin to declare the word of God and not be fearful to stand up for what is right and true. Absolutely. You know, Callie, that's very, uh, that's a confirmation, I think, of even the, the prophetic mandate that God or the prophetic drama that God wants to present 
because it's not about, you know, okay, we're going to get a million, two million people together. It's an issue of tapping into the heart of God and what he's doing. You know, we have a saying in our ministry that while men reach for thrones to build their own kingdoms, Jesus reached for a towel to wash men's feet. <laughs> if we come in the posture of humility, that if we reach out as a tangible expression of Christ, it tugs on the hearts and changes the minds of even our enemies. And I won't get into all those stories. I've seen that happen so many times with from, you know, garbage dumps to presidents of Muslim nations. I've seen how God's used that as a way to have a platform to get into conversation that changes their minds because they cannot argue the tangibility of Christ to his church. I was asked to be on two television specials many years ago in Washington, D.C. on the taping for some very well-known people. And when I was on the set, I didn't say anything. I was listening to these people much my senior and was in, just enamored with who these people were. And finally, the producer put up a sign behind one of the cameras and said, Doug, speak. And I'm thinking, what do I say in front of these people? Right? I'm just I'm the young guy. But I finally said, we're talking about the soul of America. We all know there's the battle for the very soul of our nation. But, and a generation, I said, but how can we change the soul of a city, an urban or rural community, a state or a nation or a generation if the heart is weak? I said, what I mean by that is, before we can deal with the soul of the nation, let's deal with the heart of the church. Yeah. Because if the church is awakened, then we will impact our communities. We'll impact in a very practical way, tangible way, the soul of our communities, and we will see things turned around. And so, you know, I used to be on the board for many years on a group that put out all the transformation documentaries. In 1999, we knew of four or five communities around the world experiencing the journey to transformation. In a 10-year period, at the same time with all that was happening in the world, we also noticed there was over 1,500 communities in a 10-year period around the world that are being impacted by the manifestation of the presence of God. But you don't hear that on the news. You don't hear that on the daily news. So at the same time, as you said, Kelly, there are things happening just like around us in 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago, but God was moving in powerful ways but you don't hear that as much as you do the negative because negativity right. sells, controversy sells. Today, we see all this, the world's on fire. We see our nation in turmoil. We see racial injustices. We see racial turmoil. We say all these things happening, but the five common things we found in every city or nation where God was moving in a powerful way, the five things, the commonalities we found, one is a persevering leadership. I believe we're in a time right now where friends like you, Callie and, and Lou and others, we are to be called a plumb line or a plumb bob because there is a swinging of pendulums. They go back and forth, but we need a people who will dig deep in consecration, high in expectation as a plumb line, so that when the swings of the pendulum come, they begin to come back to a place of stability in that plumb line or plumb bob that many of us are holding on to because we go deep in the Lord and high in expectation. The second thing besides persevering leadership we found was united efforts of prayer where we can focus together on, we may disagree on styles of worship, disagree on certain doctrines, but as the church, we can agree on the most important things in Christ. And we take it through a, a biblical filter and through the filter of the work of the cross, power of the resurrection. In that place, we can come together in united efforts of prayer. And I believe this is what's so important right now. And the third is not social justice in itself, like we'd see in the world, but I'm talking about a biblical social justice the kind of biblical where well, we filter everything through god's word what is true justice is yeah. not what the world is trying to propagate yeah. but what the lord is getting us to in that place of humility and the fear of the lord so we can be tangible expressions of christ and the fourth commonality we found in all these communities that were experiencing transformative revival was the area of spiritual mapping or what we call for charismatic spiritual mapping or for the non-charismatics, we call it uh, diagnostic research. <laughs> Identify the history and what's brought us to where we are, not living in the past, but raising, an, not an altar, but raising a landmark to God in these now moments so we can pray into those seen and unseen realms because God has given us an authority to preach and speak into the seen and unseen realms. You know, 20 years ago, we wouldn't, you know, we didn't even know about sending text messages or 30 years ago, pictures through the air. And you don't see all these pictures and text messages and emails going right before us right now. 
but it's still there. It's happening. It happens in yeah. a second. Take that picture and send it across the world. That means there is a, a dominion or a realm that we don't see, but it exists. God says you have an authority even in those unseen realms. This mm -hmm. is that moment we're living in. So we have an authority to pray into, speak into by the virtue of Christ that we draw from his virtue that has power to change even the unseen things that manifest themselves in the natural. And the fifth thing that we found that was common in all these communities being uh, going through transforming revival was the area of public power encounters. That's where we all recognize, look, we can go to church in our own congregations and our stewardships, but there comes a time where we when need to gather together. together in a corporate context where there's a corporate focus on the Lord, not personal agendas, not egos and logos, not selling of our merchandise, but a place we can come together, focus together in desperation on the Lord. And in that place, a corporate worship turns into a corporate release of God's virtue and anointing that changes everything. We're on the hinge of history, and we're stepping into that moment as we say yes to God to be that plumb line, deeper in consecration, higher in expectation in the Lord. That is so beautiful. That is so powerful. That is so, have you written that down anywhere? I've probably spoken on it and probably written on it in different parts of my yeah, that's powerful. From different magazines. And yeah, we're going to pull that out because that is so powerful. I'm going to have somebody listen to that and pull all of that out and write that down because it's so powerful. And I am so looking forward to you coming. We're having crowned this uh, 2024 here. Last year we had it, you know, uh, at Brother uh, Herd's Church, which is uh, Inspire Church. We had it there and it was a fantastic, we've been doing this since 2019. I think the first one I did here, we had a couple of hundred women. And then 2020, I had canceled it in the middle of the summer because you, you know what we were dealing with then. But the Lord told me at the end of the year, go on and have crowned. And we had 550 women fly in here and during COVID <laughs> and had, a, and it, it was, it was a turning point. And then of course, 20, uh, 22, because we did it in January uh, into then 2022, we did it at brother Hurd's church. Uh, we had 1400 women come. And then this year, um, We've got right now, right, right at 2,500 women are signed up and men, by the way, coming from all over, lots from Texas, but coming from all over the U.S. to gather. We're going to pray fast, stand. Uh, we're mobilizing. Uh, we're calling a remnant. I've never seen so many sold out. I'm the old chick of the bunch. I'm the old old lady. Uh, there's there's uh, plenty of us boomers there, but it's I would say the medium age is probably 27 to 45, and these women are on fire. Most of them are first-generation uh, Christians. And there's something about those first generation Christians, they're on fire for God and they're sold out to God. So we're going to have an a, a incredible um, gathering encounter with the Lord. And we've got a lot of people coming. Uh, Papa Lou's going to be there. Cheon's going to be there. Patricia King is going to be there. But most of all, Jesus Christ is going to be there. And we're going to see the glory of the Lord. The Lord told me that in this gathering of 2024, he said, I'm going to prepare you for 2024 and 2025. And he says, I am preparing my bride to be strong, to be vigilant, to do everything that God's called her to do. I'm going to, I'm going to end with this dream. I dreamed several months ago. Um, and I'm, I really spoke about it everywhere I go, but it, because it was so profound, but I dreamed I was in a multi-story building and it wasn't a skyscraper, but it was a very large building. And there was lots of Christian leaders and Christians. It was packed with Christian leaders. And, and I hear the voice of the Lord and he begins to say, Callie, get out of the building and run. And so I begin to herald to the whole crowd. We must get out of this building. We must run. And uh, we start running out of the building and we're running in a formation kind of like birds. You know how birds fly in a formation? We're running in that type of a formation. And all of a sudden I hear a blast. I look back. We're about 150 yards from the building and the building is blown into a million pieces. And instead of dying, I hear in my head, we're not dying, we're flying. We The blast actually propelled us into flying. Mm -hmm. 
and it propelled us forward. And instead, of, and then I heard in my head in the dream, instead of blowing up, you're going up. And I woke up and the Lord told me, he said, over the next few months and weeks, I'm going to give you different aspects of this dream. It's going to be like a diamond with different facets. And the first thing the Lord told me when I woke up that morning is everything that can be shaken will be shaken. The next thing he said is it's time for the church to get out of the building. And then over time, he began to explain to me that we are in a season, if we will trust God, that even though we're going to see things that are disconcerting, it's actually going to propel us into great harvest and into the ministry that we've dreamed about our whole life, where where you know, just mass harvest people. I've got friends that are in Nicaragua right now, Mountain Gateway, some friends of mine, and they're seeing 60 and 70,000 people saved at a time there. I mean, it's like they've stepped into harvest and I believe Doug, we are right there. We are right there at the greatest harvest we've ever seen. And God is saying, I need my church to put on your boots. I need you to buckle up. I need you to be willing to do the hard things. I need you to be willing to get out of the church mindset and the building and go into the world and do whatever Christ would have you to do. Then I found myself a few weeks later in DC with Jenny and we were filming and doing things. And I, you know, I'm an older lady. So I came back to my room. These girls are going a hundred hour, hours a day. And I'm like, I've got to go back and take a nap. And so I laid, went back to my room got it kind of a, not completely prostrate, but kind of just, you know, leaned back. And I went back into that vision. I've never had that happen before. And I'm in that vision and I'm flying. And all of a sudden I realize I'm on a horse. And then that horse descends down onto the earth and I'm like warring with one hand and building with the other. I felt just like Nehemiah. And then I ascended back up into the heavy, heavenlies as if, if I was getting instruction and power and strength from the Lord. And I, I realized just through what God is showing me is that we're the only way forward is to live in the ascended place. If we don't live in the spirit and live in a, the ascended place with the Lord, we're going to be really confused about what's going on here in earth, on earth, and we're going to respond wrong. So we've got to learn to live at the right hand of the Father. We've got to learn to live in the ascended place so that when we come into these situations, we can respond with the power of God, and we can respond the way Jesus would have us to respond. That is such a good prophetic word and dream. Because um, I really, when you said that, it reminded me of something I wrote, a prophetic word, an article I wrote years ago, that the horses are saddled and ready, who will ride? And I think this is the moment that God said to us, who will ride? They're ready. The horses are saddled. Who will ride them? It was a vision and then a word that God gave us confirming what you just said. And, and I'll have to send, if I can find that, send that to you, Kelly. I would love to see that. You know, we were doing some history on our family and... Uh, you know, they study both sides. Well, on my mother's side, on one side of the family, uh, and her her mother's name was Jenkins, and these young men came to Texas, and one of them was a, uh, he was a, a businessman and a preacher, and he helped establish some of the Bab first Baptist churches in Texas. But when um, when Baylor got into trouble, he got on horseback and went because Baylor got into financial trouble and they wanted to pull it out. And he got on horseback and he went from church to church, raising the money to save Baylor. And, and he, but he went on horseback. And when I had that dream, the Lord said, you know, you're not too far from that, from that ancestor of yours. I'm, I'm going to, I'm calling the remnant to get on the horses and to and to ride until we see revival until we see reformation until we see breakthrough in our country and across the world because you know america has been literally the hand that has fed the nation when it comes to missions fed the nations of the world when it comes to missions and the gospel being preached and i just don't believe god is through with us i believe there is a time and a season that we still have in front of us and i just want to see all of that come to pass i thank you so much for being with us to